We'll now go to the report from the Covington Implementation Committee. Dr. Bakewell Sachs and Ms. Cooper Comas, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Monfries, uh, President Jacobs, members of the board. I'm Susan Bakewell Sachs, Dean of the OHSU School of Nursing. Uh, and we're uh, pleased to be able to come before you and give you this update. Um, we can go to the, uh, Alice and I will be alternating um, our uh, presentations. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Or do I do it? Right here? Okay. Uh, this uh, slide provides an overview of our agenda of items for this uh, status update. Uh, we will uh, go over the implementation committee charter and membership, uh, the trauma-informed systems change, and the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging lens that we are using to guide our work, the collaboration uh, process and SBAR format that we have agreed upon with the oversight committee and have uh, completed one pilot. Uh, an introduction to our eight streams of work and the managerial leads for those groups uh, who are developing work plans to meet the recommendations that are identified in the report, uh, next steps and uh, sample reports. Uh, thank you, Susan. So um, as we reported in our previous uh, communication with the board and have provided reports both to you and to the community more broadly, our reports, our reports are um, posted internally at NOHSU now, um, as well as now on an external website. Um, as noted previously, the members of uh, the implementation committee, um, I, I think truly uh, um, evidence that that term implementation, these are the folks who are responsible for the areas within the university um, that were implicated by the Covington recommendations. So as you will see here, um, members from AEO, HR, um, the legal office uh, in particular are represented here as well as CDI um, and folks who provide, who, um, who provide support services who will be able to assist us both with respect to um, how we communicate with the community um, and how we uh, determine the costs of the uh, recommendations that we bring forward um, out of the committee. I will say humbly um, on my own behalf, but I think I can speak for members of, of the committee as well. We've spent a lot of time really um, trying to ground ourselves in trauma-informed systems change and to work differently. Um, as operators, I would say most of us came to the work sort of raring to go um, and understanding that that was not the way forward, that in fact raring to go had gotten us to the place where our community was unhappy with what we've done um, and that we needed to, to pause and, um, and really bring everybody along with us. Um, I know that that's, you know, many people came to our first meeting with a spreadsheet of, of things they were gonna do. Um, and we felt it was important to make sure we were building from the ground up, not on top of something that, that was already not uh, working for the community. Next slide. As Alice uh, referenced, the implementation committee is using a trauma-informed systems change approach, and we are applying a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging lens to all of our work. Uh, by answering the four questions on this slide as each of our implementation actions are developed. So our focus is on those at OHSU who have experienced overt discrimination, implicit bias, racism and historical trauma, seeking to better understand, help to improve their experiences, ensure leadership's accountability for changing organizational behaviors and patterns that uh, dis have disproportionately negatively impacted those who have experienced these traumas. And we want to and must ensure evaluation of our actions and continuous improvement. We are also focusing on accounting for cultural, historical, and gender factors. So as each work stream comes forward and brings their proposed plans to the implementation committee, part of what they will have to do is include an answer to each of those four questions and how it relates to the specific actions of their plan. Um, 
uh, and and these, as I said, uh, these will be part of uh, each and every work plan coming forward before it comes, it goes from the implementation committee to the oversight committee. Thank you. Uh, this slide um, is just a visual representation of the work. I will say, um, as we before I present it, that what it doesn't show is the bi-directional communication that we've had and continue to have both with the oversight committee. Um, the chairs of the oversight committee, um, as well as members of the university community more broadly, who I know have, have reached out to members of the implementation committee or the oversight committee for feedback. Um, and we appreciate all of that communication. Um, as you see here, um, and as Susan mentioned, the implementation committee has, uh, has subsets of its members who are working on particular work streams, and we'll go through that in a moment. Um, they are tasked with bringing forward um, recommendations to the implementation committee for how we will actualize the Covington report. And uh, we then meet, uh, go through the, the recommendations which are put forward in an SBAR um, and ensure that the questions have been asked and answered that we are thinking about uh, both process um, but also about people and more importantly about people at every step. Um, as we work through those, we um, again, have bi-directional communication with the chairs of the Oversight Committee on a regular basis and with Dr. Jacobs. Um, we submit materials to the Oversight Committee members for review that, uh, and the Oversight Committee chairs, which we'll be presenting to you, will we'll speak to that process um, from their uh, side. They submit written feedback um, back to the Implementation Committee, and we work through that as a group um, to determine um, how we best incorporate their feedback um, into our work. Um, and we've, we've had as, as several rounds of that where, you know, there's several rounds of feedback on any one piece uh, that we are responding to. Um, it, the work will then um, move forward from there. So for example, the first big piece of work we've undertaken is the um, position description for the executive vice president um, of HR or the executive vice president for, for people. Um, we've had several rounds of back and forth with the oversight committee that have really improved tremendously um, the, the position description um, for that uh, position and what we expect um, from that professional coming to OHSU, um, both in terms of uh, their background and in terms of how we want them to approach the work. Um, and we will not be launching uh, that, that search until we've really incorporated the feedback from the committee uh, from the Oversight Committee at different levels. Uh, as uh, Alice referenced and was on the last slide, we are using the SBAR model, which we have adapted and customized to include uh, trauma-informed principles uh, through the use of the four questions that we previously described. And this is all part of the bi-directional communication and collaboration uh, between the Implementation Committee and the Oversight Committee. Um, SBAR is an acronym for Situation, Background, Assessment, and Recommendation. It is a standard OHSU project management form. Uh, it facilitates concise explanation, rationale uh, of a problem or issue, and, uh, and allows us to um, also provide other details that may be necessary through appended uh, materials and uh, um, as we need to um, uh, provide more, we are able to. But this really um, helps us get uh, an issue clearly described, clearly defined, apply the, um, the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging lens through the four questions and, uh, and move through in an, uh, a, 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 um, a, a consistent manner that uh, we are, um, we're gonna get really good at. If I could add one thing to that, Susan, I think one, having worked through a couple of these myself, I think the important piece of it is that it forces us uh, to not just say we're doing it because that's the way it's always been done, um, or just to say it's best practice without an explanation of where it's best practice or why it's best practice. Um, so we really have to consider that as we move the work forward and, um, and write it down and in a way that uh, hopefully speaks to the oversight committee members um, if, and and uh, uh, elicits their feedback in a, in a really rich way. Um, this slide just shows the, the work streams as we've divided them, again, just from a project management perspective. 
um, obviously, you know, for, for us working on this, it's, it's not a, a project to manage, it's a culture to change. Um, and uh, so we're working, understanding that the people um, listed on this slide are really heading up a group um, and that the, the work streams include many, many people across the institution. Um, and that we are each receiving feedback um, individually, not just through the oversight committee from folks um, about how the work could be different or change. Um, again, it's been a really rich experience to um, talk to lots of folks about how processes have worked or failed them and, um, and to take that into account as we rebuild um, a, a lot of these functions. Um, so uh, this slide just uh, tells, shows what, what our next steps are. We've defined the scope for the, each work stream as noted in the previous slide um, and asked um, a particular leader to head them up. Um, we will be defining the timelines and providing the timelines uh, to the oversight committee as well as to you uh, as members of the board um, by which we will uh, track our progress on each of those um, work streams. Um, as noted, the, the oversight committee, I'm sorry, the implementation committee meets twice a month. Um, obviously, a lot of this work has to happen outside of those meetings and everyone understands that. In fact, the, the meeting time is a time for us to bring developed um, ideas forward for review by the committee as opposed to a work stream meeting, if that makes sense. Um, with it, in parallel with the timelines um, and as, as um, recommendations come forward, we're developing a budget estimates for the cost, whether they are um, positions that we need to add or systems that we need to add. Um, and then we will um, bring that framework um, through the management uh, performance reporting process that the Oversight Committee has asked us to use um, uh, to track progress both for them and for you. This slide uh, shows uh, two samples of uh, uh, what, could, what may become, what will become our accountability framework or dashboard that we expect to launch uh, next month and that will provide for what the Oversight Committee has uh, asked for. Uh, obviously monitoring and tracking to document progress against the recommendations is a very important part of our processes and also our communication uh, uh, capability. Um, uh, in these samples, uh, one is uh, based upon the top one actually is based upon a draft from Dr. Moreland Kapuya. Um, and the, um, the one below is uh, the OHSU performance management platform uh, tracking that is used uh, by the OHSU um, Enterprise Program Management Office. Um, you can see that uh, the recommendation in, in as we bring these together, the, uh, the outcome of a, of a single process will include the recommendation uh, to be identified, target dates, and ability to see progress for completion so that we have a visual dashboard that we will all be able to uh, monitor. You will have, um, the Oversight Committee will have, and of course we will be using it and updating it as our work um, progresses. That was our presentation. And we know that the oversight committee chairs will be presenting after us, but we're happy to take any questions that you have. Ms. King? Yeah, I mean, this may be premature, um, but what is, what is the mechanism that you're going to use as you're developing all these systems and implements uh, to understand and hear from the broader community? Um, certainly, I, I'll begin and answer and, and also point us back to our fourth question, which is we're, we're hoping for continuous improvement. Um, so we will, I know, um, need to, to refine as we move forward. Um, so our first sort of group that we hope and, um, and expect to get um, input from is the Oversight Committee. Members of the Oversight Committee represent um, our community pretty broadly. Um, we know that they have gone back to, to their um, cohorts to get additional feedback on the work that we're doing and to bring us feedback on, um, from, from their perspective. Um, again, the, the 
information about our both our meeting minutes um, and what we're proposing is posted broadly um, on OHSU now. We know that as we bring policies forward, for example, they will be posted and we will ask the community for feedback as we normally do um, when we um, propose a new policy. So we are trying to gather lots of, of ways to, to um, communicate with the community in a fairly broad way. Um, again, understanding that we may need to re rework that if we're not feeling like we're getting enough input. It, my question, I think, was similar. Maybe I'll ask it a different way. I, 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 we noted the work streams, but where are your work stream leaders getting their inputs and in content from as they design <laughs> these things before it even gets to the oversight committee review? Uh, I, I, well, they, they start with um, their teams and the work that, um, that has actually much of the work uh, in certain places that, that started even before we had the report in hand. Um, uh, they are, uh, at, then the process really begins for, um, for our review at our level. Everything will be provided through our websites, the two websites. We have an oversight committee website and we have an implementation site uh, uh, website. Uh, where all of our meeting minutes, notes, um, uh, and plans are, are being posted. Um, I, I would say that um, there is a lot of thoughtful discussion about that and ensuring that we are capturing, that we are seeking and that we are capturing input as well as feedback so that we have input at the start of the plan and we have iteration and exchange that allows for more feedback. What we're seeking is to find a, a, the best starting place that we can based on the information that we have from all of our sources, including the report itself. Um, and then uh, our commitment to continuous quality evaluation and continuous quality improvement. And to put a fine point on that, um, you know, we have asked the work stream leads to, to get as much input and to involve as many people um, as, as is appropriate in each of their work stream development. Um, we know that this is happening in some places. We will certainly um, again, be asking those questions um, as we go through the lens that we're using. How did you develop the answer to that lens? How do you know um, that the solution you're proposing actually takes into account the cultural trauma people may have experienced um, is one way that we're doing that. And I, we will see. Again, we're, we'll, we're ready and willing to um, review our process um, as, as we move forward. In fact, in our chart, in our documents, we have a commitment to review uh, periodically all that we're doing and make uh, changes as we go forward. I guess one last question then for me. So we were talking earlier, it's a process, it's a journey. Um, things are not going to change overnight, but we're, we're committed to it as a community. Um, but have there been any quick wins that you guys have identified or been able to identify? I think one thing we talked about from the report was um, the, the various avenues for people to report issues. And we thought that in the recommendation notes that we can streamline that, that seemed to be something that could be a quick win. How, what's the process on, on that particular item or if there are any other quick wins that you felt uh, you discovered? We actually reviewed the first um, draft. That was the very first SBAR brought forward to our meeting yesterday, as a matter of fact. Uh, and we uh, have provided, uh, we provided feedback as a group. Uh, we are, our goal is to have um, that SBAR ready to go by May 2nd. Uh, so that it can go out to the oversight committee members before their May 12th meeting, in fact. Um, uh, we hope to have more than one SBAR, but that, that is at the top of the list. Great. And, and I will just add to that, I think, you know, it, so many things seemed easy, um, and right. it, it's actually, many of them are quite complicated. So, for example, with respect to the reporting mechanism, um, the, one of the questions is, is it a, a a mechanism to gather reports, or is it the only place that people will report? And what is the trauma-informed answer to that question, for example? Um, and so, and, and to the extent that that it is a mechanism for reporting, um, is it is it a reporting mechanism that people will feel comfortable using when they are in the midst of trauma? So there are lots of questions we're trying to answer as we go along, um, and again, not just not just build on top of what we know wasn't working for the community. Great. Well, thank you both, and thanks to the committee for the work. Um, and like we said, it's a journey, uh, but it's a journey that takes the entire community to, to lean in. So we appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Thank you.
So we'll now have a report from the Covington Oversight Committee. Virtually. Yes, and it looks like the sun is shining very bright. <laughs> Mr. Alexander and Dr. Marlon Kapuya. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear us okay? Volume, yeah. Volume up, please. And uh, what about my end? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Wonderful. Well, we um, thank you, uh, Chair Munfries, President Jacobs, and the Board uh, of Directors for this opportunity to update you on the Oversight Committee. I just will speak to, before we move into our um, opportunity to share what we've done, I've heard in the financial report, the financial report from Mr. Fernstall and also heard from Allison, Dr. Bakewell Sachs, and to the extent I think I heard some of the board members ask about or speak to, uh, what we're speaking about is really subcultural and cultural changes and shifts, which um, take time, practice, time and practice. Um, and it's not about being perfect per se, but being perfectly committed to a process. And so that's what we're going to spend some time to talk about. Uh, on today. If we could please kindly move to the next slide. So you've heard uh, about the trauma-informed lens and framework, something that we are uh, really have taken very seriously, and not just in word, but in deed. And the, the real question was, how do you take a set of principles and operationalize them organizationally and systematically um, and intentionally? And so I want to just briefly share what those what the six principles are and how we've uh, worked to model it um, and to um, to enact it. So SAMHSA or the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration <coughs> has outlined for us all what these trauma informed principles are, um, which includes ensuring physical and psychological safety, um, a commitment to consistently being transparent in decisions. Uh, that are being made, um, and this is really a means of building trust uh, to offer mutual support in healing and recovery, uh, acknowledging and managing power dynamics in any space, program, or um, uh, room, and making room for augmenting voices or the voices of individuals in the community, and really highlighting individual and collective strengths. It's also what I call respecting shared expertise. And then finally, but certainly not least, and quite critically, uh, this trauma-informed frame includes recognizing and addressing overt, overt discrimination, implicit bias, racism, and historical trauma, which accounts for cultural, <laughs> historical, and gender factors. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of operationalizing with through the oversight committee, it's not lost on Mr. Alexander or, our, or myself that while uh, there are 39 members uh, that represent a wide diversity and we're gonna encourage folks to actually go to the webpage because we could not uh, include all of the rich stories and bios of each of the 39 members that are widely diverse and represent various uh, employee resource groups, various programs, divisions, locations, geographies. Uh, we think that that's critically important in ensuring that we get um, a rich product that, it, that, that gets us to goal, which is the sustained change over time. And it really is a cultural change. But we also wanted to make sure that these trauma-informed principles were also reflected in how uh, we ran the, the oversight uh, committee meeting. And so I wanna talk just a bit about the meeting structure. We meet every second Thursday of the month for 90 minutes. Of course, there is some in-between work. We try our very best to be very clear, concise, thoughtful. Um, each of our meetings before we start, it starts with the 60 second mindful moment or reflection. And that really is to ground us in the work instead of doing things kind of business as usual is jumping from one meeting to the next. Let's get down to it as opposed to being intentional in pausing, acknowledging that these are human beings who are coming into a shared space for a shared purpose. And we want to acknowledge that. And let's just remind ourselves of why we've gathered around in this virtual space for this cause at this moment, at this time. So we do that every meeting without fail. We have community agreements that have been defined, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. There's a shared decision-making process that we established and co-constructed. It's important that every voice feels uh, heard and is heard. 
um, and that the, again, a healthy appreciation and respect for shared expertise. Um, also, active and continuous feedback. It's the recognition that we have to move down parallel tracks, that there there is a framework that's proposed, and then there's open, uh, as, as information changes, as new data comes in, we make shifts accordingly, we create space for bi-directional exchange, and we understand and appreciate that feedback is the cornerstone of excellence. So we welcome it, we invite it, and we welcome it. Collaboration, we take time to work in small groups, to actively think through the things that are being brought to us and um, a real healthy appreciation for group feedback. I'll shift next slide and I'll turn it over to Mr. Alexander. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Malik Kapoor. And uh, good afternoon uh, to members of the, the board. Um, as Dr. Malik Kapoor underscored, the what of our work is important, but the how is equally important. And, this is a group of 39 individuals who, in some cases, were recognized leaders and voices in the community, but in others, these were folks whose voices were fairly obscured. And for many of them, the findings of the Covington report were shared experiences, but for others, there were unique ways in which the environment at the university impacted on their lives daily. In constructing the committee, we really sought to bring together prominent and less visible or heard voices. We believe that in order to hear all, we needed to hear from all. And we were always asking ourselves, who needs to be at the table? So not only were the employee resource groups, our gender, race, and cultural affiliations, faculty, administrators, and students, schools of professional and academic discipline, our bargaining units, but also community members who work in roles supporting operations, evening staff, night facilities. This is a 24 seven institution and we wanted representation and inputs from 24 seven perspectives as well. Additionally, we have six at large members who are self nominated from within the community and we received 192 self nominations to select those individuals from. And so it's fair to say that this is a group that holds a shared characteristic of not only having seen a lot, but equally important, they expect a lot. And that is a part of our charge. Our community agreements are defined by three areas of focus. One, listening. Two, learning. And three, shaping the work of the oversight committee around norms that allow us to stay engaged for what we know is going to be a long journey. Our role as co-chairs, I, I characterize it akin to being Sherpas. We are there to help navigate this path in a way that is equally focused on outcomes and safety. We want this to be a space where the dialogue can be frank candid and it's sometimes frustrating but that tension between expectations of pace and scope will decide how effective we are our community agreements are designed to recognize this reality and to allow for a safe and unrestricted participation on the part of our members can we move to the next slide i just want to offer some brief comments relative to our oversight charter President Jacobs, the board charged us with the responsibility of reviewing, monitoring, and providing input to the implementation committee. And we are tasked with supporting efforts to activate the recommendations of the Covington report. We expect that the work product of the implementation committee will include metrics, timelines, a monitoring of completed, in process, and planned actions and that pathway was just evidence in the presentation that you received from their chairs. But I think additionally, we're charged with differentiating between accountability for outcomes versus aspirations. We want to be able to create outcomes that can be embraced and sustained. And we realize that there's a tension between the urgency of now and the equally compelling realization that this is going to be a long journey. The efforts of the implementation and the oversight committees are a starting point. They're not a final destination. 
and we acknowledge that there's a tension between the two at times and it is our role to express that tension not to mitigate our foundational strategy and our orientation to our members and to the institution are housed in an understanding and an embracing of trauma-informed principles and practices and we want this to not only be embedded into the culture of the institution but also to have these principles serve as a focal point, sort of a values-based North Star for all members of our community. And like any good process, we need to evaluate the effectiveness of it. We will stop each six months to step back and look to see what is working, what we may need to improve upon, how do we learn from the lessons of the last six months to influence the next six months? Are we on path and do we as an institution and as a committee and as a cohort committed to this work, believing that we are structured to now move forward and continue to sustain the progress that we hope and expect this work to produce. So I just wanted to, again, have you understand how we charge ourselves and the backdrop of how we work as a committee. Um, next slide, and Dr. Morland Kapoor, let me turn it back over to you. Yes, beautifully, beautifully said there. Um, I feel like we're uh, on one of those game shows, Mr. Alexander, where it's like, and now, um, but, but thank you so much for stating that so, um, so thoughtfully. And I would, I would add uh, to that, that you, as you speak to that tension and, you know, tension in any growth process by nature is disruptive in some sense. And I think you used the word in a meeting uh, that we had with the co-chairs a few days ago, that it's what we call creative tension. And I thought that that was a nice reframe that the, the tension is expected, necessary and needed to get to the work product that we see. Um, so to that end, uh, we, we, we talked a little bit about this. We wanted to also in the context of the oversight committee in working in collaboration and really in partnership with the implementation committee, because it is right. We're all working towards a shared goal. We have different roles, but we are working towards a shared destiny. Um, as we, we, we think about sort of what tracking and monitoring progress towards recommendations look like, both uh, Dr. Bakewell Sachs and, um, and Alice showed you the, uh, the, the, the tracking mechanism that we, we all uh, had discussions about and really agreed upon on how we think actively think about framing the work and, and, and tracking it. Um, the, the other piece that we we thought was important to acknowledge in the context of this is that there were a number of efforts that preceded the actual Covington report being being done and and placed all those recommendations and the full of the report being placed publicly. There were a number of efforts that included the uh, the Black Employee Resource Group had 14 points that outlined a desire to see more diversity, more accountability, uh, more training requirements for leaders, just to name a few. Um, and then the OHSU Vision 2025 strategy, which equally there were some points of convergence uh, in, in that in terms of how the, the institution grows. So we, we want to acknowledge that there were a number of efforts that preceded the convening of the oversight committee that preceded the convening of the Covington uh, report. Um, and, and those things, uh, we don't wanna lose sight of those as we do this work, although the focus is on those recommendations. Um, next slide, please. So what we know is that the name of the game is we move into doing things differently. Again, we had pointed to, we wanted to pause, to take time. We wanted to demonstrate in how we constructed our work uh, in, in the actual framing and the operational, oper, operationalizing of the actual meetings, we wanted to demonstrate what it looked like, what it felt like to be trauma informed. We also know that communication is the name of the game. Communication, communication, to communicate why something is happening, why it can't happen, why it's not happening yet. That, that the ability to have access to information and knowledge is really um, akin to having in, to having access to power. And so to that end, um, we, we wanted to make sure that what we were doing uh, in terms of all of our communications and what we were sharing in the context of the, of the oversight committee was being placed very publicly in a place where everyone could access it. And I mean everyone, to be able to go to use it as a resource, to pose questions, to really follow along in parallel with us, to basically say that makes sense, that doesn't make sense. And so uh, we, we've worked with the strategic communications team there to, to actively think about what the content, what the feel of these web pages should look like for both the 
uh, Oversight Committee and the Implementation Committee, and as has been stated in the prior presentation, you can go on to the O2, the, the internet, or even the publicly facing page and find things like um, our notes, the you know minutes, our resources. There's a whole uh, page dedicated to trauma-informed resources. So everything that we're doing in committee, we want to make sure that folks have can can get their hands and minds around it and respond to it accordingly. Uh, we also thought that it was important to make uh, all of the monthly reports that we're doing uh, available. The other piece that's critical in terms of communication and shaping this work is the weekly meetings with President Jacobs. He clearly has his hand on the pulse and, and is uh, very close to this work and wants to know from every single step um, in, in terms of ensuring that this th that this gets done in a way that um, that that acquiesces to the true spirit of what the goal is, which is to transform OHSU for the better, to be safer and more inclusive. We also meet uh, weekly with the Implementation Committee co-chairs, and it, that has been a really nice experience of uh, bi-directional exchange and, and, and exchange of information and also reshaping and really an opportunity to, um, to point out, but in, in a very thoughtful way to call in what potentially might be blind spots, right? To have a group think and to say, well, have we thought about that? There's a level of thoughtfulness um, and intentionality that has been incredibly um, instructive and I think will be useful over time. Next slide, please. So just uh, as, we, as we close out, uh, we really wanted to just take this opportunity to, to talk about the structures that have been put in place that will really ensure this is not a one-off, this is about those subcultural shifts and transformation in a sustainable way that we're looking for. Just a few takeaways. Um, we have been doing many trauma-informed lectures for our oversight members. Each of those lectures are now placed as a resource for all of OHSU community uh, members to access, to use. We've also encouraged all of our members to take, we do, uh, Mr. Alexander and I, a, a, a summary, a co-chair summary after each of our meetings. We make that available with resources in a nice little package and we ask each of the 39 uh, members of the oversight committee to take that to their respective cohorts to share that widely, but to also point folks to the web page. And so I'm saying that for anyone listening today, go to the web page. We have placed everything there. We want you to know what we know. We want you to follow along. We want to hear from you. We, we honestly, and earnestly believe in feedback. Um, and then this idea of consistency and educating on the trauma-informed framework um, is really critical. And it gets beyond just educating, but it is uh, talking about it, it is doing, um, it is making adjustments based on what's in front of you. Um, and it also is this modeling, right? Um, like our meeting structures and communication. And then to be willing and open enough uh, again, to make the adjustment, to take the, not to only hear the feedback, but to apply it in a way that folks feel heard, uh, in seen, involved, and included. Um, so we are feeling quite encouraged by this process. There is uh, quite a ways to go, but there is also a lot of good uh, signs of the, 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 the hope uh, that lies ahead, uh, which I do believe it does. And so um, we thank you for the opportunity to do this work. Again, it takes time and practice. It's not about being perfect, but what I have asked and what I think we're, all, we're asking all of us who, who's involved in this endeavor is to be perfectly committed to the process. It does not mean that the mark will not be missed. However, we have to be sure uh, in our efforts. We may lose a few games, but I'm hoping that the ultimate goal is that we're looking to win the championship. So um, I, I thank you all for the, uh, for the opportunity. We will pause for the cause turn the virtual mic back over to uh, Chair Mumphreys and we'll take any questions, last slide, challenges, reservations. Thank you both <clears throat> and to the committee for the work. Uh, we appreciate the transparency and the inclusiveness that you've put into this process. Uh, with that, I'll look to the board members to see if there are any questions. Mr. Brar. A uh, quick question about those um, mini lectures you just referenced. Uh, I know you said that you, they live on your web page. Um, are there any plans to kind of uh, use those more widely across the organization? Because I, I feel like, you know, um, spreading those more widely could be of benefit. And especially, you know, maybe if it wasn't, it's one thing to have them optional there. It's another thing to have them, you know, more widely integrated. And I think all of us could use um, some more information on trauma-informed principles. Yeah, thank you for the question. And actually, we have the the goal was, and I think that this is one of those 
the things where uh, we are open to doing it better um, as, as we know how to do it better. So we have some student, um, some, well, medical student and also resident representation and school of medicine representation. And we've asked folks to share that widely. If there is another mechanism, I know that most clinics and programs and departments and chairs have like share points and things like that. If there is a um, effective mechanism, that is feedback that we will take back to um, our, to the communication representatives on our committee who are committed and excellent and we will definitely share that that information it is our goal i agree with you in order for us to move towards a shared destiny we all have to have kind of shared understanding and access to the same information uh, so um, if you have additional thoughts on how we might do that we will we will humbly receive it uh, and act on it thank you i'll be sure to get in touch if i if i have anything and as part of that shared journey because we're all on this together the board will also be receiving trauma-informed training in June so that we can also participate in, in this journey with you in, in, in this way. Yes, I <laughs> thank you, Dr. I was just commenting, uh, thank you all very much for that presentation. Is my mic on? Yes. I just wanted to second that idea and, and uh, comment that uh, um, many of, uh, I think actually all of our executive vice presidents, including yours truly, have undergone some of uh, Dr. Molan Kapua's training. And I think there's opportunity to continue to extend that throughout the uh, university and its members. Thank you. I was uh, the collective around the table. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you both, uh, Mr. Alexander and Dr. Moreland Kapuya. Thank you for that presentation. We look forward to hearing from you um, when we get together. Um, but the work continues, and certainly we're here at um, your disposal um, for anything you want to discuss as this goes on, because it is, again, a shared journey, a shared process. Thank you. Thank you. And the word Thank for the day. Thank you very much. Everyone have a safe weekend. And the word for the day, persevere. Thank you. Thank you. Peace. Thank you. Word for the day, persevere. <laughs>